Hospital. This is Miles Gangler, and I'm interviewing Dr. Henry Forsythe in his office. And this interview is sponsored by the CHS English Department. And the date is the 5th of January, 1990. Okay. First of all, what can you tell me about medical school? Just anything. Well, I can tell you about medical school. It's, uh, it's long and it's difficult. And... Um, it used to be difficult to get into medical school. It's not as difficult to get in now because there aren't uh, as many people uh, wanting to go to medical school as there used to be. Uh, a lot of people used to want to become physicians, I suppose, because of what they liked, but also because they thought it would give them from some prestige and standing in the community, I think, and doctors always used to be uh, looked up to and honored a little bit, and uh, uh, nowadays that's all changed, and um, uh, doctors aren't uh, uh, looked upon with such uh, uh, good feelings as they used to be. In fact, um, there's a lot of lawsuits now, and that's why a lot of people aren't going into medicine, is simply because... Uh, uh, you know, you can be wiped out with one lawsuit, uh, everything you worked for. So, and uh, when I applied for medical school, there was um, there was uh, five on, on an average year. There would be five applicants for every place in medical school, and now there's not quite two for every place in medical school. So, uh, a lot of the good people are going into other professions or other occupations. And, doing other things, but uh, medical school requires uh, at least 90 hours or three years of college in order to get into it. Uh, most people don't get in until they have four years and have earned their bachelor's degree. A lot of people will earn a PhD degree while they're waiting to get into medical school, or they used to years ago, they don't so much anymore because it's a lot easier to get in now. And then uh, your medical school is four years, and uh, after that you do a residency. It used to be we would take uh, one year of rotating internship where we would rotate through um, surgery, internal medicine, obstetrics, and uh, pediatrics, and then go out into practice as a general practitioner. Now they don't do that anymore. You take a residency in family practice, uh, which is three years long, or you take a residency in pediatrics, which is three years long, or you take a residency in surgery or internal medicine or whatever specialty you want to go into. You just take a residency in that specialty. And those residencies may vary from three years to as much as seven or sometimes nine years in some specialties. What was, are there differences between medi medi medical school, the methods they use today, as opposed to when you were in medical school? Well, when I was in medical school, um, uh, you, you had to go four years to medical school. You would be admitted to medical school, you would start out in the fall. It was a prescribed curriculum, everybody took the same things all the way through. Uh, you could take summer school courses and maybe lighten your load during the year, but uh, it wouldn't shorten the time. Everybody took the same thing and they had to go for four years. That was law. Um, the only people who took summer school courses were those who might have flunked a course in, during the year and then they would take it over in the summer. Um, but now, uh, about the time I got out, they started uh, allowing people to go right through the summer between your junior and senior year and, and get out of school in uh, March or April, get out early, and start your internship then. And since then, it's changed so that now people have a lot of electives they can, they can take. Uh, they have to take certain courses, but then they can take other courses depending on what their interests are. And uh, at schools like Michigan State University Medical School, 
uh, they have do two different tracks. You can you can go on track one where you go through the regular school, or I think it's track two or whatever they call it, where you can study at home and take the exams. And when you can pass the exams, and you can go on, and you can do it at your own speed. And uh, and this is uh, particularly useful for um, uh, women who are married, have children, you know, and are going to medical school, and there are a lot of those now. When I went to medical school, I think there were five girls in our class, and now the, the medical school classes are approximately 50 percent women. Hey, what can you tell me about the epidemics or diseases when you were first becoming a doctor? Were there any major ones at that time? Well, um, when I was in medical school, uh, the worst thing that everybody feared in the way of epidemics was polio, poliomyelitis, uh, which caused paralysis, sometimes it would cause death. Uh, that's the disease they used to put people in iron lungs for because it would paralyze their breathing muscles. And um, when I was in my fourth year in undergrad school or my first year in medical school, I'm not sure which, I can't remember for sure, there was a really bad polio epidemic uh, and a lot of people were crippled from it, a lot of people died and um, uh, so polio was feared but polio never did kill as many people as measles and, and a lot of people used to regard measles as just a Thing that every kid got, and they got over it. And uh, but measles killed more people than polio ever did. Well, since I have been in practice, you know they've developed the uh, polio vaccine, so we we never see polio anymore. I have seen one case since I've been in practice. Um, the measles vaccine has been developed. The, the rubella vaccine, which is three-day measles, has been developed. The mumps vaccine has been developed. And um, so now we, we seldom see those diseases anymore, measles, mumps, and rubella. Uh, the diphtheria pertussis and uh, uh, tetanus vaccine was around when I was, when I was in school when I was a kid, but it wasn't a required thing until um, I think sometime after I got in practice they passed the law that kids had to have those vaccines to go to school. So, you know, we don't see whooping cough epidemics anymore. We don't see diphtheria anymore. We don't see polio. We don't see measles. We seldom see um, mumps or even three-day measles anymore. So all of those things have changed. Um, then they've also developed a, a pneumonia vaccine for uh, uh, for certain kinds of pneumonia that uh, people can get one shot and it lasts them a lifetime. And uh, so there's uh, and that that's for the regular old um, pneumococcus pneumonia that used to kill so many people before they had antibiotics. Um, Smallpox, uh, we used to vaccinate like 14 to 16 million kids a year in this country for smallpox. There hasn't been a case of smallpox in this country since 1949, so several years ago we stopped vaccinating for smallpox in this country because out of those 14 million people there would be six to a dozen kids would die from the effects of the vaccine every year which isn't much out of 14 million, but uh, it was still too big a risk to take when there's no longer any uh, smallpox in the country. So it's been many years, I don't remember how many now, that we quit vaccinating for smallpox. And now there is no smallpox anywhere in the world. It's been eradicated. The only disease that we've ever eradicated completely from the face of the earth. Um, okay, could you tell me about some changes that have taken place since from 
when when did you graduate from medical school? 1957. From 57 to 1990. Well, I guess I was just telling you about some of the changes. We've uh, pretty much conquered a lot of the infectious diseases. Uh, when I got out of medical school, we had about three antibiotics. We had sulfa, we had penicillin, which were developed during World War II, and we had the tetracyclines, uh, acromycin, teramycin, and um, there was another mycin, oreomycin. They used to call them the three blind mycin, it's just, just for something to call them. But those were our uh, antibiotics, sulfa, penicillin, and the mycins. Uh, now we have many, many more antibiotics, much more specific and more potent antibiotics, uh, which have been developed, and um, uh, we've, you know, we've gotten to the point where we can almost uh, be sure that we can clear up almost any infection that a person gets unless the, the person has some physical defects that, um, uh, that make it impossible for his own system to fight infection because antibiotics, for the most part, do not really kill off the infection themselves. They help the body to get rid of it. And in some cases, if somebody has a very stressed out immune system or their immune system isn't functioning properly, uh, you know, such as a bad alcoholic or something that gets pneumonia, uh, that can be a very, very dangerous situation. When I was in medical school, they had discovered the first medication that specifically would treat high blood pressure. Uh, before that, all they had had was uh, mild sedatives and uh, uh, keeping people away from salt and um, putting them on starvation diets and getting their weight down and, and so forth. There was no specific treatment for high blood pressure. When I was in um, the last year or so of medical school, they discovered a, a drug called Rawolfia, uh, which uh, was, would specifically lower blood pressure. Um, since the um, since that time, we have all kinds of specific medications for lowering blood pressure, and raw wolf is hardly ever used anymore because it had some side effects that weren't desirable, uh, such as stuffy nose, and it caused depression and some other things, but it did get blood pressure down. One of the things that's brought about all of these improvements and so many different and new and more specific medications is um, radioactive uh, uh, materials that we can use to tag different cells. We can put a, a, a tag, a chromium tag, for instance, on red blood cells and we can watch them in all stages of development in the body and, and uh, know what they do. And, and we can do that with white cells, we can do that with uh, the so-called T cells, and, uh, and we can um, also uh, identify various hormones, various um, uh, compounds in the body and, and see how they're formed and what they do and where they go. Uh, we can test a lot of things. We can test thyroid function. Uh, we can um, we can do tests on the heart with radioactive uh, uh, compounds. And uh, that one thing alone, which all came from the atomic bomb research, actually, has enabled us to develop all these real specific medications uh, to treat specific diseases where when I started practice we had those three different antibiotics and we had this one medication for high blood pressure and other than that we had aspirin to treat arthritis and uh, we used a lot of phenobarbital to calm people down and pain medications to relieve their pain and 
hope that their natural defenses would get them better, which it did in most cases, but now we can do a lot more. Doctors are usually are, are looked up to. How does this make you feel? Well, I've never felt like I was uh, any crown prince on a white horse uh, riding into the community to save everybody's life, if that's what you mean. I'm, I'm just a common, ordinary individual, and um, I, I have spent a lot of time learning certain skills, and uh, I've spent a lot of time over the 30 years I've been in practice keeping those skills up and learning new things as they happen. Uh, but my place in the community is is probably not any more important than uh, uh, most anybody else's place in the community. Uh, if it's cold and you're out of fuel oil, the fuel oil man is the one that's important to you. If you're sick, well, the doctor is important. If you uh, need a new uh, um, outfit, then the clothier is the one that's important to you. You see, it depends on what people's needs are, but I don't feel like I'm any better than anybody else. Uh, I just feel like I'm one of the community here. And, uh, I like to think that I've been able to do some good things for people, and I think I have. Uh, but uh, lots of people do good things for people, you know, automobile mechanics. And, most important people in the community next to mothers, I guess, are school teachers, not, not doctors. School teachers, they touch more lives probably, and, and especially when they're young and growing up and, and in the formative stages than, than doctors do. But we all have a mix to fill, and I've tried to fill mine. Then why do you think doctors are looked up to so much? Well, I think in the past uh, there was a certain mystique or mystery about medicine and treating people. And of course, when people get sick, uh, they they need help. They want help. They they call for the doctor to come and see them. They call for the minister to come if they think their lives are in danger. Quite often, or the priest and. Uh, I think over the centuries, doctors have been looked up to because they they did respond to people's needs. They would would uh, travel, make house calls, and uh, get up in the night to, to deliver babies and to be with sick people. Even though up until about the time I got into medicine, there wasn't a lot that doctors really did except to be there and and offer comfort and uh, relieve pain and so forth, which I, that's important too, but, um, you know, there wasn't uh, a whole lot of specific things we could do for people, but, but doctors over the years have, have been looked up because people thought they knew an awful lot, and I, I guess they did know an awful lot of anatomy and physiology and things, but we didn't really have a lot of weapons to fight with until after World War II. And there's been a big, big increase in uh, numbers of, of effective, specific medications. There, there are almost no medications in use now that were in use when I first started practicing medicine. Practically all of them are brand new. Now you said some of these drugs were developed by atomic bomb research. How well, the, out of the research to develop the atomic bomb, they learned about radioactive materials and various isotopes that they could uh, use. And this didn't come out of the research for the bomb particularly, but they learned about radioactive things and how to, how to produce various radioactive isotopes. For instance, iodine. Uh, when it goes into the body is taken up by the thyroid gland and because of atomic research they learned how to how to uh, make radioactive iodine I-131 and uh, so they learned how to give a, a certain dose depending on your body weight 
of I-131, radioactive iodine, to a person, and then at intervals afterwards, they could go over your thyroid gland with a Geiger counter and find out how much it had, had taken up. And that way they could tell how active your thyroid was, whether you had an, uh, an inactive thyroid or an overactive thyroid. And then later on they learned how to, um, how to um, get a, what they call a gamma camera, which will record the pattern of that radioactivity and record hot spots in your thyroid that take up a lot more of it or cold spots that take up a lot less. And it was discovered over the years that cold nodules in the thyroid were more likely to be malignant. Hot nodules that took up a lot of that thyroid or a lot of that iodine were not likely to be malignant, so we didn't worry so much about them. But if you had a cold nodule that didn't take up much, then we always thought we had to take that out because it was more likely to be thyroid cancer. And it's that sort of thing that I was talking about when I said that from the atomic bomb, research has progressed to the point where we can tag radioactive isotopes. We can make, we can make different cells, different solutions, different compounds radioactive, put them in your system and watch what they do and what happens to them and where they go. And an awful, awful lot's been learned about physiology since that development. Okay, you know, I, I have a couple of thing, topics to ask you about and just contrast them from when you were first started to be a doctor to now. Okay. Um, transplants. Transplants were unheard of when I started uh, 30 years ago. Uh, they weren't transplanting anything. They were starting to fool around with kidney transplants a little bit, but they weren't successful at that time. And soon afterwards, they did develop a, a, a means of successful transplantation of kidneys that would last. And from that, for years, that was the only organ that was transplanted. And then several years ago, they transplanted a heart in South Africa. And since then, they've, they've been transplanting hearts and, and uh, then livers, and uh, now they're uh, uh, starting to think about transplanting um, the heart and lungs all together. It would be much easier. There would be a lot less, uh, lot less sewing and attachments to do if they could do the heart and lungs in one big piece. Um. Cancer. Uh, cancer has always been with us, uh, probably always will be with us. Uh, I think it probably always has been with the human race. Uh, most pathologists feel that all of us, if we live long enough, will develop cancer of some kind. Now, over the years, there was a lot of research done on breast cancer, and they found that there was some uh, virus that they could uh, create cancer in in mice, uh, breast cancer in mice uh, with this virus, so they thought uh, cancer might be a viral type thing. I don't know if that's ever been definitely proved one way or the other. Now in recent years there's um, there's been a, a lot of research coming out that links cancer of the breast, cancer of the bowel, uh, to uh, fat intake, uh, excessive fat intake in the diet. Um, it's hard to say whether that's true or not. When I um, started practice, uh, cancer of the lung wasn't as common by any means as it is today. Um, and it was seen mostly in men. Uh, as the effects of the heavy cigarette smoking that became very prevalent during World War II among the men in the service um, made itself uh, felt. Um, men had a lot of lung cancer over the years. Now women are catching up to men with lung cancer because since World War II women have been smoking more and more. So the incidence of lung cancer in women has, uh, has increased. 
Um, there have been various changes in, in cancer. Uh, the incidence of uh, cancer of the stomach uh, has been going down in this country. Uh, when I was in training, we saw quite a few cases of cancer of the stomach, cancer of the esophagus, and um, I saw one or two or three cases in the early years of my practice. Now it's pretty rare to see cancer of the stomach or cancer of the esophagus. Japanese people uh, that never used to have that disease at all are now uh, finding an increase in cancer of the stomach and cancer of the esophagus in their people. Some people are attributing this to the fact that they're now eating more beef and high-fat foods like we used to eat in this country. But uh, cancer, the pattern of cancer changes. We, we didn't have chemotherapy when I started. We had uh, uh, radiation therapy and surgery. Those were the only two ways to cure cancer. Now we have chemotherapy and there's one or two types of malignancies that can be cured uh, with, uh, with uh, chemotherapy. For the most part, chemotherapy simply postpones, slows down the growth of it and prolongs life, but it doesn't cure. But in choriocarcinoma, in which occurs in women uh, sometimes, and uh, Hodgkin's disease, why uh, uh, chemotherapy can be curative in those two diseases. Okay. So am I, am I to assume that when you were first starting to be a doctor, if you needed a transplant, no. There were no transplants at that time. So it was unheard of? It was, just it was unheard of, yeah. They were starting to experiment with kidney transplants. And kidney transplants have been by far the most successful transplants uh, that we have. Um, when you were in undergrad school, and people going to undergrad school now planning to go to med school, are there any differences in the curriculum they're taking? Well, I'm sure there are differences because there's a lot of difference in scientific knowledge. Uh, but I think basically the same types of courses are still required, like uh, you have to have a certain amount of chemistry and physics and uh, mathematics. And uh, I wouldn't know, you know, what what the requirements for medical school admission are now, but. There were certain courses you had to have, and um, I'm sure that those that same kind of courses are still required. But the knowledge, you know, uh, and the information that's available in all of those fields is far greater than it was when I was in undergrad school. So well, the, the courses would be different, I'm sure. What did you take when you were in undergrad school? Well, I can't remember everything I took, I, but I took uh, chemistry up through quantitative analysis, qualitative and quantitative analysis. I had to have organic chemistry. I had to have um, uh, physical chemistry, and you had to have physics. Um, I can't remember now what all the requirements were, but I, I took other courses. I got a Bachelor of Arts. Um, I took a lot of speech courses. Um, um, took a lot of English courses. Um, I wanted a Bachelor of Science in Zoology when I was in undergrad school, but I was I had a family. I had kids before I even started college, and uh, so. Uh, I just couldn't put in the time that it required in the laboratories to get the Bachelor of Science, so I, I settled for a Bachelor of Arts because Bachelor of Arts courses don't require those laboratories and uh, so much. And uh, for an hour spent in class, you get an hour's credit, you see, or three hours a week. At least that's the way it was when I went to school. If you had a class that meant three hours a week, you would get three hours of credit. Uh, for that semester, for that course. Now, if you were taking uh, a chemistry course or a physics course, 
you might spend an hour in class three times a week, but you might spend six hours in lab in addition to that, all for a three-hour credit course, you know, and I just didn't have the time for all that because I had to work all the way through. Okay. What advice would you give a prospective student planning on going to medical school? Well, the, the advice I would give him uh, would be the same advice I would give him if he were going to engineering school or uh, if he was going to be a school teacher or anything else, to um, uh, pay attention to your studies, to uh, uh, learn as much as you can, even in undergraduate school. Um, I would also tell him to learn how to uh, take advantage of recreational activities. Don't uh, don't spend all of your time just studying and uh, so forth. And uh, particularly when when you're in medical school, um, anything you can learn in medical school or in your residency programs, uh, you should learn it. Don't look at something and say, well, I don't think I'll ever use that because the day will come when you will have a need to know. And uh, if you've learned it, you know, it'll be there. If you didn't learn it, it won't be there. And um, it's, it's just a good thing to learn all you can. And then, but that applies in engineering or teaching or whatever course you're going into. The other thing that um, that I, uh, I would stress is to be thorough in the things you do and not try to do things halfway because when you're dealing with people's lives, you know, especially in medicine, you have to make enough decisions uh, where you can't ever be 100% sure of, uh, of, of what's happening that you just can't afford to be guessing at a lot of things that you don't have to guess at. So, yeah, you ought to learn to be very thorough in what you do. The other, uh, the other thing that I would um, really like to emphasize and was emphasized when I went to medical school is uh, honesty and personal integrity because um, you're dealing with people and if you're going to be a successful physician, you know, uh, people are not stupid and um, they soon learn if you're not honest with them. And, uh, you'll have a better practice if you're always honest with people. Uh, that was one of the things that was really emphasized at the University of Michigan. We lost two out of our class very close to graduating because they just failed to maintain strict honesty. One of them did a thing so simple as to uh, just write a value on the chart of a patient when he was supposed to do a blood count and he didn't do the blood count. He just wrote on there what he thought it might be and and when the uh, professor was making rounds and told the, the patient that her blood count was so-and-so that morning, she said, Doctor, I didn't have a blood count this morning. And that guy was not in medical school anymore. He wasted his college years, he wasted his medical school years because they wouldn't tolerate dishonesty at the University of Michigan or I don't think at any other medical school. What's the hardest part about being a doctor? Well, I think the hardest part about being a doctor is um, is the fact that uh, if you're a conscientious person you're more or less on call and uh, responsible for your patients 24 hours a day. It's not as bad now as it was when I started because people used to call any time of the day or night and expect you to respond to their call. They don't do that anymore. I've, I've only refused to make um, one house call in the 30 years I've been in practice. and. Um, I can recall one other house call that I kind of talked somebody out of 
that I've always wished I had made that house call, but I didn't actually refuse to make it. They just asked me for advice, and uh, and uh, I kind of talked them out of the idea of having me come to see the patient. But anyway, they don't bother me anymore. Emergency rooms are now staffed usually 24 hours a day, and they can always get help there, and people tend to do that rather than to uh, bother me and I, of course I appreciate that although it's more expensive for them and everything but uh, one of the most difficult things about it is that you feel responsible you you um, you don't close the office door when you're through for the day and go off to the movies or go bowling or or just simply take off to go up north for the weekend like a lot of people are able to you uh, you you have to make arrangements for somebody to look after your people while you're gone and uh, that's that's one of the difficult things. It's not it's not often as difficult for the doctor because he's you know most physicians are really quite dedicated to what they do and to their patients, but it's very difficult for the doctor's family because they don't always understand why you can't just take off and go to a movie or take off and go away for the weekend like the neighbors down the street are able to do. Okay, that brings about my next question. I was going to ask you, what what does being a doctor and being a father demand? Well, it just demands more, I think, maybe than a lot of uh, a lot of other occupations. Um, but I think you can still be a good parent and and be a doctor. You just have to. Um, somehow make time for your family and uh, it can be done if you uh, work at it but you do have to work at it because it's so very easy to get so wrapped up in practicing medicine and there's always always more that you can do um, uh, you know you, you you could be busy 24 hours a day if uh, if you really uh, wanted to and could, so it's very easy to get wrapped up in what you're doing and to neglect your family, but you, you have to be careful about that and uh, pay some attention to your family and make time for your kids and and let them know that they're important to you. And we've always tried to do that. We've taken our kids on vacations and we've spent time with our kids and uh, I think by and large it's worked out all right for me. But I would say that's the most difficult thing. The other difficult thing now that's come along is, is um, the lawsuits that uh, doctors uh, are plagued with now that never used to be in the early years of my practice. And it's a devastating thing, you know, to have a patient that you've taken care of for a lot of years and, and that you thought was um, uh, one of your friends and had confidence in you to sue you for something that that really isn't your fault, wasn't anything you could do anything about. And yet, you know, they see an opportunity to make some money or some lawyer hears about something and talks them into suing you. And, and that's, a, that's a devastating blow and it really causes a lot of problems in doctors' families. Um, the divorce rates are are a lot higher in doctors' families since uh, lawsuits became so prevalent. There are even uh, foundations have been set up to counsel doctors and their families that are having lawsuits. And, uh, and we have one in Michigan, and there's probably one in practically every state in the union. But that's another difficult thing. But that's I don't consider that as part of the practice. I think that's a it's something extra that isn't really involved in the practice of medicine itself. Do you think that scares potential doctors away? Oh, sure. That's why we aren't getting as many physician applicants and we aren't getting the best people in medical school like we used to years ago um, because the best people um, are smart enough not to get into an occupation like that. This has nothing to do with it, but 
Are, is the low, more people going to law school now? Is that increased? Well, I don't know as it's increased. It probably has some. Uh, medical school classes have gotten larger uh, also because there's more people in the country and they need more doctors. Uh, the fact is, you know, we've in, admitted a lot of uh, foreign medical graduates to this country because there was at least a perceived need for more doctors. Now, there never was a real shortage uh, except there was a maldistribution. More doctors would go to cities where they could make more money in some rural areas where the people were a little poorer, they couldn't make as much money, uh, didn't have enough doctors. But by and large, if you figure out the ratio uh, of population to doctor, there's always been an adequate supply of doctors in this country, but they weren't always in the right places at the right time. But um, um, I've forgotten what your question was now. It was just about, it was not. Oh, it was, about was, was there more lawyers being educated? I think there are probably more lawyers being educated. There's, there, we have more lawyers in this country than the rest of the world combined in the United States alone. This is a very litigious society. It doesn't just apply to medicine. It's, uh, you know, everybody gets sued now. The automobile dealer, the, the bar owner, and, um, uh, companies that make machinery. You know, if somebody gets hurt on a machine, even if they've taken the guards off and they've done all sorts of things to make it unsafe, uh, they still get sued for it and quite often have to pay money if somebody gets hurt on the machine. So it, it isn't just that they're suing doctors, people are suing everybody. Specialists, how has that changed from when you first were a doctor to Well, today? The, when, I, when I first got into medicine, you know, we had specialists in internal medicine, we had surgeons, general surgeons, who did practically all kinds of surgery. They did chest surgery, they did uh, gynecologic surgery, uh, they... Um, they used to fix broken bones, and pin hips, and that sort of thing. Uh, although there were orthopedic surgeons, bone and joint surgeons, there were uh, gynecologic surgeons, uh, and there were surgical subspecialties, but there weren't as many. Now the general surgeon is pretty much confined uh, to um, the abdomen. Uh, the gynecological surgeons uh, do gynecological surgery and and now we have chest surgery as a whole specialty, cardiac surgery as a whole specialty, uh, neurosurgery. There was um, not too many neurosurgeons in the country when I started up. Now there's neurosurgeons in practically every city of any size. Um, there are uh, uh, it was quite unusual when I started practice for people to um, to do gastroscopy where they looked down into the stomach with a gastroscope. Well then, uh, and we had a, a rigid sigmoidoscope to look at the bowel, but we could only see 20 centimeters of it. The Japanese developed the uh, flexible gastroscope and the flexible colonoscope and the flexible... Um, call it to look in the lungs with. Anyway, the Japanese developed flexible scopes and since then there's been this whole burgeoning specialty of gastroenterology where their their main function is doing endoscopy where they look through the whole bowel, look at the stomach. And um, um, now we have uh, we have pulmonary